Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Our first big conversation this morning is about the reported arrest of Sunday Adeyemo, also known as Sunday Ibuhu. Um, the news says Sunday was arrested in an airport in Kutunu while trying to jet off to Germany, um, the, the country where he's a citizen. Uh, we've invited Mr. Femi Lawson to help us, you know, discuss the facts. Good morning, Mr. Lawson. Uh, Mr. Lawson, can you hear us? Clearly. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, first things morning. first, what's your reaction to the arrest of Sunday Adiemo? Well, it came uh, not at a surprise because the Nigerian government has been on a man hunt for Chief Sunday Adiemo, popularly called Sunday Igbo, since the last invasion you know, of his residence by operatives of the Department of State Service a few weeks ago. So it is understandable that the Nigerian government would have been doing everything possible, you know, to get him arrested. And we should also understand that Nigerian government in the recent time has shown some proactiveness when it comes to, you know, arresting people, you know, especially outside the shores of this country, more than they seem to be able to do within the country. So it's not a surprise. Okay, so so um, there is a little bit of controversy over um, extraditing him to Nigeria or not, and also trying to figure out how the arrest uh, happened, the role of uh, you know uh, the uh, security agencies over there, and of course here in Nigeria. Um, how important are these details um, in this whole conversation? It is important. And uh, I think it may not have been shared as of now because of uh, the national security implication it may have for the country, the Benin Republic, especially when you look at you know, the tendency for others who may you know, be on the list of government, not only in Nigeria, but other countries for political reasons. So it has a lot of implication, not just on the you know, not just on our country, Nigeria, but also on the country where he has been arrested. Just remember the last time the leader of the, of the IPOB was arrested in Kenya, and this has been generating a lot of diplomatic issues as we speak. So I know that this is also going to raise some concern from the diplomatic circle, and of course, individuals across the globe who may you know, see that country as a place where they may not be able to pass through again, even when they are on under genuine, you know, victimization by authorities of their country. So it has a lot, in my view. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Adeyemo's lawyer, his his name is Yomi Aliyu. He argued that there's an extradition treaty of 1984, that's between Togo, Benin Republic, Nigeria, and Ghana, and that that extradition treaty doesn't include political fugitives, which um, Sunday Adeyemo seems to be right now. So how then would you assess the role or assess the role of Benin Republic in the arrest of Sunday Adeyemo? You can be rest assured that uh, the Nigerian government would not define Sunday Igbo, you know, as a political fugitive. The truth is that they have criminalized every of his agitation. They have, you know, given an impression that he's been wanted for criminal purposes. And uh, you must understand that no authority, especially that of Nigeria, would assert that it is politically victimizing people just like we clearly understand it is doing. So the request may not be based on the agreement as existed. And another thing you must understand is the dependence of that country economically. Mr. Lawson, um, I see where Mr. Lawson was headed. He, he was just talking about 
a possible economic dependence on maybe Nigeria and how, you know, the way Nigeria is seen in the African um, context and how they might not want to be on Nigeria's bad side. But I really was going to ask him about um, what exactly will be the designation of Sunday Adeyemo in this case. If he's saying Sunday Adeyemo is not a political fugitive and so he does, or rather, Benin Republic does not have a, um, is not obligated to, you know, keep him in the country. But also, this Sunday Adeyemo's lawyer like I mentioned, quoted um, Article 20 of this extradition treaty, saying Article 20 of the Charter basically states that um, signatories um, should allow self-agitation. You know, agitation for self-determination is a fundamental right that is protected. So if we don't want to call him a political fugitive, we know that Sunday Adeyemo has been agitated for the Yoruba nation and secession, you know, of basically an independent Yoruba nation out of Nigeria. So if we say it's not a political fugitive, does this apply? Well, I think, you know, the, the Nigerian government may have also looked through some of all those things and can easily change, um, you know, the charge against him. You know, he can wake up tomorrow morning and, you know, place a different charge entirely. But then, exactly, but uh, then that, that would really now border, that would not border on sincerity. What exactly is the fact? Because remember that when the DSS raided um, Sunday Bo's house in, you know, earlier in July, they said that he, the raid was because of um, illegal possession of firearms and they went on to list a whole, you know, cache of arms that they had found in this place to kill two people allegedly because we saw the blood on the floor and all of that. So really, was it because Adeyemo had a stash of arms in his house or because of his agitation for Yoruba nation? So we need to, if we're saying the federal government can simply just change the charge, what is the sincerity there? But good to know we have Mr. Lawson back. Mr. Lawson, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So yes, please continue with your thoughts. And I also want you to, um, first of all, you were talking about what exactly is the stance of Benin Republic regarding the extradition. Also, you mentioned that Sunday Adeyemo could not be seen or could, should not be regarded as a political fugitive. But we can understand that one of the reasons why, you know, there seems to be a spotlight on him from the federal government is because he's been agitating for a Yoruba nation. Isn't that right? You are correct. You are correct. But you must understand the position of the Nigerian government on this agitation by Sunday Igbo and some other actors that within the country as we speak. Another thing, I listen to you, and another thing I think we must be realistic about is the posture of the incumbent regime in Nigeria to rule of law. This government does not so much believe or does not so much obey even laws that are made by the administration. So to assume that the government will pass through the roots of legitimacy or how it should have been done, to me, will be an illusion. Hmm. This government did the same by going to Kenya to bundle somebody who was you know, carrying a British passport well, God knows whether in Crete to Abuja a few weeks ago. So we, we cannot assume that this same government would, you know, go by the dictates, just like you said, of those uh, extradition, of the extradition treaty currently existing between Nigeria, Ghana, Togo, you know, and the Republic. But let us fold our hands and see if the country Bene would not act, you know, ignorant of what is happening in Nigeria and we on the basis of what, co what is contained in our agreement, you know, do the right thing by treating Sunday go as a political fugitive. Mm. All right. Uh, there's also been uh, uh, statements made with regards to the influence of, uh, or the possible influence of uh, uh, former of Army staff, uh, uh, Tuko Buratai, in all of this. Um, uh, there's uh, been those conversations. And I also want you to speak on... Uh, those who have said, you know, if it's so easy for the government to pick up people that they, you know, as, uh, term or see as fugitives outside Nigeria even, why is it so hard to end banditry and arrest terrorists in Nigeria mm -hmm. who have shot down fighter jets, who have uh, killed thousands of Nigerians and who currently control some territory, reportedly? Thank you. Uh, let me pick it from where you stop. You see... For those who are celebrating some of these recent feats of the federal government, the arrest of the IPOB leader, and now 
the intersection of uh, Sonigbo in Benin Republic, I want to say that it should even be a moment for us to be ashamed as Nigerians that our government, you know, could have enough, you know, commitment, you know, have enough will to get people arrested even in far away Kenya, far away Benin Republic, but few kilometers away, even from the seat of power in Abuja, terrorists are operating during the day. Only a few days ago, a fighter jet of the Nigerian Air Force was brought down by people who were merely described as cultural wrestlers and bandits. It tells you that, and this has further exposed the the, the, the federal government on the reality of it's not being proactive in tackling insurgency within the country. I would not want to believe that these terrorists, who I don't call bandits, who have continued to terrorize, particularly the people of the Northwest as we, Northwest as we speak, are invisible to the extent that we have seen you know, a, a, a cleric going to meet them. We have seen people reporting how they move in hundreds we have seen these characters going to school to conduct mass abduction of students, and the government will keep saying it is no, not powerful enough, just as it is, to get people who are you know operating or who are you know agitating for self determination rather, but you know but could not get people who are terrorizing the country from within. So it really exposes the insincerity of the government. And I think uh, for people who also think the person of the former chief of army staff to Benin Republic might have had a, had a role to play in this, I think uh, it is not uh, totally out of place because uh, the ambassador represents the president of Nigeria in that country and there must be diplomatic cooperation. He must be interested in what happened to Nigerians within that country. And if a Nigerian has come in, and it's on the watch list of his country. I know he must have been contacted before you know, the authorities of that country took that decision. Hmm. Okay. Um, on the Punch newspaper this morning, it was reported that um, former your state governor, Rashid Ladoja, has asked the federal government to grant amnesty um, to Yoruba yeah. Nation agitator Sonde Adeyemo. Um, here's a quote from him. Ladoja said, the federal government has declared amnesty for Boko Ram, and they should declare amnesty for Igbo and the IPOB leader. Um, do you agree with him? And is there any likelihood of this ever happening in the country? It is not impossible, but this government is not willing, and I can say that this government will not. This is a government that treats people, particularly from some particular, from some region of the country, as not being entitled to certain things it is doing, especially when you talk about you know, respecting the right of the people to demand. See, self-determination to start with, you know, is what the people have rights to demand for. It is not left for the states or the authorities to analyze this and see if it's truly you know, the collective aspiration of these people. I'm a Yoruba man. I am not a supporter of any call for the disintegration of Nigeria. As far as I'm concerned, it is best for us to restructure this country than to break it away. So some of us are not even sympathetic to those who think it is time to, you know, to split the country. That nonetheless, we must respect that people have rights to make such demand. It is an internationally recognized right for people to demand for self-determination. And the government of Nigeria should not criminalize this. It is better for government to sit and engage these people rather than declaring war on them in the way the government has been doing. And if we continue to declare war on people like Sunday Bowo, the um, one of the canals in Nigeria, we must be ready to receive or to witness the emergence of more of such characters if we don't embrace the culture of dialogue, you know, and then discuss with our people whenever they have reasons to, you know, to agitate. We must not criminalize the right of people to express themselves, especially when such is being done peacefully. Okay, well, there's um, 
Uh, I also want to go back, uh, you know, and talk about the, you know, if you can, uh, the extradition uh, uh, perspective. Um, of course, uh, his representatives will continue to fight that and hope that that doesn't happen. Uh, there's also, I've seen a few reports that, you know, suggest that he may have been released already um, over there. Um, so, so what is the chance, you know, from what you say, stated earlier, based on the relationship between Nigeria and Benin Republic, what is the chance that uh, his uh, extradition to Nigeria can be stopped? Well, it's, uh, it's purely a diplomatic issue. And uh, unfortunately, it is happening in a country, like I said earlier, that has a lot of ties, you know, with Nigeria, especially when you look at the economy of that country. It may spell positivity, you know, for democracy, and the right of the people to make demands from government without unnecessarily being harassed. If the government of Benin would do the right thing by releasing Sodebo, but I also think that uh, the influence and the fact that Nigeria government would never agree that Sodebo is a political fugitive, but rather make their demand, you know, having already, you know, paraded him behind him as a criminal, as somebody illegally possessing firearms, and all sort of, you know, charges that are already been prepared by the Nigerian government. I don't, I don't think the Nigerian government will succumb. Oh, well, um, I'm still going to be following up, you know, and uh, seeing if there is confirmation on these reports that he has been released. Uh, by the uh, government in Benin Republic. Um, but I, I also want you to react to the um, conversation concerning a possible friction between the North and the West, you know, with regards to Sunday Go's arrest. Uh, do you think that that is possible? Um, do you think that it might, you know, lead to a break in the relationship between uh, not the North and uh, Northern leaders and, of course, uh, Southwest? No, you see, if you look at this country in the last couple of years, you realize that uh, we have been more fragmented, we have been more divided than it has ever been, especially in the last couple of years. So to me, I don't see even any sincere unity existing between the North and South today in Nigeria. Today, we now have, you know, Southern governors coming to speak as a body, you know, making demands as Southerners, not any longer as, you know, used to be even despite, you know, glaring political party differences. It tells you that there is a lot of division already. The people are divided along not just North-South, but also along their religious and other biases. And it is because the government has not been doing enough to promote national cohesion and unity. And this recent happening will further, you know, divide not just leaders of the North and South, but even the ordinary people, the ordinary Nigerians from the North and South, if not well properly managed. If it's not well managed, if this government does not begin to immediately engage citizens in conversations that promote unity, not by mere you know, threats or harassment of people who make demands, I think uh, we may just uh, be at the starting point of what the future holds for this country. Yes, indeed. What we need there are calls for unity. Well, Mr. Mr. Femi Lawson, um, can you draw any parallels between this case of Sondi Adiemo and Namdikanu regarding the modus operandi of the government's um, raid on their houses and arrest out of the country? The, the, in that of the similarity is so much. And you see, we have to be sincere. Like I said, I am not a pro, you know, secessionist element. But the truth is that since we were, we have all witnessed how the Sunday Bowl group have held rallies in Ondo, in Ikiti, in Osho, and you know, some other places before the last one that was disrupted in Lagos by the state. If people gather together, call it any name, call it any reason, and peacefully conduct themselves without bearing arms, without, you know, embarking on violence against 
anybody, be it citizen or citizens or properties of the state, I don't think there's any justification for government to tag such persons as terrorists and declare war on them, like the Nigerian government do, did by invading the house of the IPOB leader then, making it a template for him to have escaped, to have jumped bail, because that invasion was unwarranted. And the same thing has happened now to Sunday Bo. So it looks so much like it is the approach that this government best understand, the use of force in a democracy. And this will further, you know, create tension. This will further create such characters that are deviant and are ready to resist the antics of the Nigerian government. And I don't think we need that now as a country. All right. Mr. Okay. Femi Lawson, um, I want us to go back in time and make comparisons between where we're coming from as a nation and where we are now. When we cast our minds to as far back as the 1940s, when the activists, the educationists, um, Fumilayo um, and Nikola Kukuti would organize um, you know, rallies with the Abekuta Women's Union back then, and they received lots of opposition from the government. They began to term it as picnics and festivals to gather women together, you know, to protest against you know, taxes on women and market women. But we still saw the heavy-handedness of the government you know, on those women move back and fast forward um, to the year 2021, and we're still seeing the same thing. Would you say then that it doesn't seem that the Nigerian government has made any improvement regarding how it relates with the people that it claims to serve? You see, one thing that the government in Nigeria lacks, every you know, of the successive regime that has come to this country have not fully realized that the sovereignty of this nation is not in the hand of the government. It is in the hand of the people. They try to run this country as a private estate, as a personal you know, businesses, at the detriment of those who have actually chosen them or who they sometimes choose themselves you know, to represent. And it is a terrible you know, impression that we have created in the mind of generation after generation that as Nigerians, it is criminal for you to speak against government. It is criminal for you to protest against government. Where in the real sense of it, it is within the rights, even constitutionally granted, for citizens to express themselves. The freedom of expression is not a gift. It is not subjected to the wish and aspiration of any government. Mm. It is given to the citizens by the Constitution. Mm. But successive administration have continued to overlook that provision of the Constitution. They have continued to overlook you know, that, that sovereign power given to the people by the Constitution because of their desperation to always protect their regime. And that is what is still happening till today. Unlike other democracies all over the world, even in the worst of circumstances, protests are not criminalized. Citizens have right to protest for as long as they want and as long as such does not turn violent. Until, if you see government in the, in the Western countries bringing out you know, police you know, or, or the military into situations that are normally supposed to be civil, it, you must have got it to a point where violence has crept in and you know, state properties are becoming Treated, but if we don't have that, people can sleep streets or you know occupy the streets for days without anybody harassing them. Unlike in this country, where even two and three cannot gather, mm -hmm. talk less of having a mass of people making demand. Okay, let's let's go back to you know something you had earlier mentioned. I, I, I um, what what do you think? Um, what story do you think this would tell of the current administration if? You know, by 2023 and even further, we are still not able to, you know, point out bandit leaders. If you remember not long ago, there was a video of a bandit who had claimed and boasted of killing Nigerian army, um, of killing uh, Nigerian soldiers. Um, uh, that video, of course, uh, went viral. Uh, there's still no report of him being arrested. Do you think the current administration is bothered of what that paints of it um, in the time that they've been in power? 
Well, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think this administration is in any way interested in posterity. I don't think this administration is interested in how it is going to be judged after the eight years of the current president, President Muhammadu Buhari, because if you look at the democratic credentials of this administration, if you look at the assessment that local and international institutions have about this administration, you will understand that it has come to accept its failure as far as in observance of human rights, as far as its commitment to the life and properties of Nigerians are concerned. We should have seen more seriousness on the part of this regime if it is truly committed you know, to the protection of the lives and property of Nigerians more than we are witnessing. If it, it, it is really worrisome that the country keeps moving on as if nothing is happening, even when the most horrible are happening. Let me tell you, just two days ago, 13 policemen, 13 policemen were killed by these terrorists in Zamfara State, and we keep moving on as if all is well. Not even at the police headquarters is our flag flying at half mast for 13 policemen to have been killed by terrorists in a day. You know what it means for an American policeman or an European policeman to be killed in a single operation? 13 of our soldiers are being killed every day by these criminals, and the government they still think it is not enough to declare total war on them. And that is why I say I don't think this government is interested in posterity. Hmm. Um, do, do, does this also, um, now you're, you're speaking of posterity, um, does this do any damage to, um, I've seen um, statements from certain persons uh, claiming that uh, Fulanese and the, the North you know, seem to always be attacked. Uh, here and there, you know, and of course, you know, they, 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 um, their statements weren't, you know, a lot of people didn't agree with their statements. But does this do any damage to the credibility of the North and the Fulanese um, after this current administration? Well, it will do more damage to the credibility of the operatives of this, go of this government. You see, when you talk about the North, Today, a lot of Northerners are victims of, you know, what we are talking about in this country today. I have friends across the north. <laughs> I have friends of over 20 years who are Fulanese. I have friends who are Kanuris. I have friends who are Hausas, you know, from all over the north. And I can tell you that a lot of them are now victims. Only 48 hours ago, one of my friends traveling between Busu and Sokoto was attacked and you know, he lost a lot to that attack. <laughs> so we are all victims as Nigerians. The Northerners are also victims of what is happening. And that is why I say it will tell more on everybody, especially those from that region of the country that have participated in what is happening, that have been involved in how this government has you know, been like a Desica about tackling issues that has now become a threat, not only to us in the South, but even more to people whose region you know, are, are, are now being ravaged by this criminal element and government keep watching. Um, final question from me, Mr. Lawson. Um, Adeyemo's legal team and some Nigerians in diaspora have been calling on the German government to intervene and uh, make sure that um, Sunday Adeyemo is not extradited from um, Kotonou. Um, seeing that um, Adeyemo is a German citizen and his wife as well, um, what's the likelihood of uh, intervention by the German government? As we've seen in the case of Anambi Kanu, where the UK has offered consular assistance. Well, it, it is possible, provided he is not just a resident, but a citizen of that country. I'm sure you know, there will be interface between the government of Germany and the government of the country where he's been held, since it is not Nigeria where the government can hold on to him for obvious reasons. But that will greatly rely, like I said, on his citizenship and the swiftness 
in taking such steps. Remember, it has been revealed that Mr. Nandi Kano was arrested even while flying on a British passport. You understand? Mm -hmm. It means, as far as this government is concerned, it is ready to take any shortcut to achieve its aim, as long as you know arresting those whom it has seen as enemies are concerned. All right. Femi Lawson, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank you. Uh, we wish you a great day ahead. Thank you too. All right, uh, stay with us here on The Breakfast. Our next conversation is moving to Mali, where there was an assassination attempt at the current interim leader. We'll get into that conversation next with uh, our international uh, correspondent and uh, analyst, Imar Edet, who will be joining us.